Hello, welcome to this is Alan Nesse, and I'm joined today with Dr. Alan Nevins, uh, endodontist practicing in Southampton, New York. Alan, thanks so much for joining me. You're welcome, Ali. It's good to be here with you. So Alan is visiting town, and I asked him to sit with me and share a couple of the cases that he had uh, on him, and uh, he's been kind enough to uh, use some of his time here with us to share his knowledge and some of his cases, and that I think are going to be interesting, and it's about more or less the role of CBCT imaging, right? That's correct, Ali. So terrific. So let's get to it, Alan. Let's see what you got. My presentation today is going to uh, review the role of CBCT in advanced endodontic diagnosis. In 2015, the American Association of Endodontists, in conjunction with the American Academy of Oral Maxillofacial Radiologists, issued a position statement reviewing the various appropriate uses of CBCT in endodontics. And today, I'm going to concentrate on the diagnostic portion of this. I used uh, CareStream 8100 in my office to do all this imaging, which is one of many good machines. It's very high resolution, uh, low radiation dose machine, easy to use. I review the images with the patients in three orthogonal planes, that is planes at right angles to each other. Sagittal and coronal views are excellent for reviewing pathology related to landmarks and axial sections are good for reviewing the um, shapes of roots and root canal systems. I'm going to speak first on um, two landmarks, the mandibular canal and maxillary sinus related to pathology. And this patient presented with a carious exposure of tooth number 31. Uh, we see two fused roots. We're not sure how many canals there are in this tooth. And the apex is superimposed on the mandibular canal. But what we don't see is the true proximity of the root to the mandibular canal. In 3D imaging, we see this in exquisite detail. We see also that the two canals join into one in the apical foramen. And a high mag uh, view, coronally, we see that the apex is in direct uh, apposition to the mandibular canal. We can scroll just a few microns and um, see that the apical foramen being open poses a very high risk for transmission of infection. And also, if we were going to treat this tooth, a high risk for extrusion of sealer into the, um, into the mandibular canal. So in this particular case, Alan, the um, open apex uh, means that you're going to have potential mechanical, chemical, and biological trauma to the periapical area in proximity to a vital structure, such as the infiabular nerve, what are some of the ways that you would recommend that people can avoid extruding, uh, over-instrumenting, you know, over-extruding uh, both chemicals such as the hypochlorite and the disinfectants, as well as the cements during observation? Yeah, instrumentation is done uh, using a, a Roots EX apex locator to get accurate measurement. Irrigation done very carefully with special syringes, uh, side vent syringes. And the obturation technique I use uh, on all cases now, especially this case, is important. Single cone calcium silicate technique. Yeah, so you know, key is going to be ma maintaining the, uh, uh, getting the apex, so having your apex locator, use it properly, confirming it with a radiograph to make sure that it's there and you haven't made a mistake. Because with an open apex, you're gonna have also difficulties with the reading on the, on the apex locator and so on. So, and also with the irrigation, making sure the needle is never engaged and blocked, and the same thing with the cement and the placement of the cement. Yes. In a second patient with more advanced periapical pathology, we see the axial section of um, the CBCT. The roots are skewed lingually, and the lingual cortical plate of bone is, um, is resorbing. And we can see as we go through step serial sections and into the coronal section, that this is a direct route of transmission of disease into the submandibular space. Yeah, that's another critical case to have that diagnosis ahead of time for treatment planning. It's so important uh, because of the fact that, uh, first of all, if you're going to be doing surgery versus non-surgical, you need to know how much bone you're going to have to go through. And the more lingual it is, the more difficult it is for the surgery to take place, especially in these molars. Secondly, also understanding the severity of these cases is where the ex the perforation occurs is going to be anatomically, whether it's going to be above the myelohyoid ridge or below the myelohyoid ridge where the myelohyoid yes. attachment is, 
or you're going to end up either with a sublingual infection or a submandibular infection. And that's why you treat these more aggressively is what yes. you're saying. And the CBCT imaging helps tremendously in yeah. predicting this. Yeah, cases like this where have been sent to me for apicoectomy and I realize that they are so far lingual that apicoectomy would be precluded, I uh, may usually in, uh, tend to gravitate towards intentional reimplantation in those kinds of cases. Next, I'm going to uh, speak about the uh, maxillary sinus. This um, uh, communication between the um, roots of maxillary teeth and the maxillary sinus is so prevalent and has so much in the way of implications that the AE has issued a separate position statement in 2018 indicating uh, appropriate imaging and treatment. The dental literature is uh, replete with case report studies demonstrating that there is a high correlation between uh, odontogenic infection and maxillary sinus infection. And the medical literature also has many numerous case reports. So we see, especially in patients that present with unilateral uh, maxillary sinusitis, that there is a 75% correlation between that odontogenic infection and maxillary sinusitis. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? Because if it's bilateral, it seems to be more systemic, probably as opposed to you know, allergic response and so on. But if it's unilateral, given the fact that the path of least resistance for, uh, for peripical infections is not determined universally to be either buccal or lingual, it could very well be apical towards the uh, sinus. It's important to have this three-dimensional ability to so know. I ask, this is part of a question that I ask of every patient that uh, possibly presents with this. Uh, this patient presented a 25-year-old female with tooth number 14, symptomatic on percussion, swollen face on the left side, swollen buccal mucosa, um, and the electric pulp testing was non-vital. Uh, the periapical lesion on 2D imaging is uh, very uh, obscured by bone so that it's, um, it doesn't give us the information that we need regarding the um, uh, proximity of the periapical lesions to the maxillary sinus. 3D imaging gives us this information in exquisite detail. It looks almost like a schematic diagram. We see a perforation, a direct route of the periapical lesion uh, of endodontic origin into the maxillary sinus with a mucositis and a, uh, a periapical osteoperiodontitis is a separate lesion with a thin corticated border uh, that is a result of the sinus membrane being inflamed. We also see that the mesiobuccal root contains a patent MB1 and a calcified MB2. The distobuccal root is calcified. So um, patients like this, I like to submit the full volume of images on a disc to uh, um, uh, a radiologist. Here we see the distobuccal. Uh, and our colleagues, uh, the, um, the dental radiologists, give us a full report. Uh, this is a separate specialty, and I highly advise that this be done in these types of cases. And this radiologist at Stony Brook University suggested three possibilities. Um, this turned out to be a periapical lesion of endodontic origin on biopsy and inflamed cyst. However, the possibility of o uh, OKC, odontogenic keratocyst, is very real in this case. Odontogenic keratocyst mimics periapical lesions of endodontic origin, has a high rate of recurrence, and is fairly common. They're commonly missed. It's a missed diagnosis. Right. I mean, you know, it's Occam's razor, right? The most common to the least uh, common is probably the best explanation. Uh, and, and here in this particular case, it seems to me like on a younger patient, it appears that the necrosis occurred slowly but very early on, since you can see the arrested development of the pulp chamber in terms of size and also the patent uh, mesiobuccal canal. Maybe those other canals that were, you know, the distal buccal and the MB2 were um, remained vital for a much longer time, and so they got cal calcification, whereas the, the MB1 died very early on. This is a, just a long-term infection that has been proceeding for a long time and obviously uh, you know, draining straight into the sinus. And we can have odontogenic uh, lesion in conjunction with keratosis. I've seen cases with separate etiologies, so yeah. we have to be careful of that. Or the keratosis uh, causing the... Um, 
devitalization. devitalization. Uh, the second patient presented um, with a disc taken on a medical grade uh, CT scan by an ENT specialist uh, because uh, this patient had root canal treatment by another dentist on teeth four and five. The lesion did not resolve and the patient had um, recurring unilateral sinusitis. So this is a red flag for an odontogenic um, cause of sinusitis. And as we scroll through axial sections, uh, we can see the size of this lesion um, is, um, is great. And this has perforated the buccal and lingual cortical plates of bone and into the maxillary sinus. The biopsy taken by an oral surgeon showed this to be OKC, a, th a thin uh, layer of epithelium with uh, um, subjacent connective tissue that's not inflamed. Yeah, so in this case, it seems like probably either the OKC caused a necrosis and they did the endo, or maybe someone just looked at a radiograph, saw a large periapical radiolucency associated with, the with these two roots, and they assumed that these are necrotic and they required the root canal, right? Yes, that's correct. That, that's so important to have that combination information from not just the periapical radiograph. You see a large lesion doesn't necessarily mean endo, especially sometimes it could be a correlation where the tooth has a, you know, has a large filling. Yeah. But it's vital. That's why it's important to do all the pole fatality tests. What's exciting about this new age of, um, of diagnosis with CBCT is it's not cookie cutter. This is another dimension of, um, of this imaging is in, carries us into a, another dimension of diagnosis. It's just more information, right? Just more pieces to the puzzle that you're going to have to put together to figure out what it's going to, to look like at the end. And uh, more information is usually better. All right, so to make this not too long, uh, Alan, let's uh, cut this down into uh, uh, two parts, and let's come back in the next video to talk about a couple more cases. cases. Great. Awesome.